All right. Our next hymn is number 272 in the new hymnal. 272 in the new. Two seven two in the new. Give me the Bible. Give me the Bible. Star of gladness gleaming. To cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming. Since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible. Two seven two. is number 253 there is no other name like Jesus 253 in the new hymnal there is no other name like Jesus it's the dearest name we know it's the angels joy in heaven it's the Christians joy below sweet name dear name there is no other name like Jesus sweet name dear name there is no other name like Jesus 253 in the new Other name like Jesus. There's no other name. When the like heart Jesus. with grief is sad. When the heart with grief. There's is no sad. other name like Jesus. There's no other name like Jesus. When the heart is free and glad. When the heart is free and glad. Everybody, sweet name. Sweet name.
Tis the hope that I shall see him. Tis the hope that I shall see him. When in glory he appears. When in glory he appears. Tis the hope to hear his welcome. Tis the hope to hear his welcome. That my fainting spirit cheers. That's my fainting spirit cheers. Sweet name, name. There's no other name like Jesus. Sweet name, name. There's no other name like Jesus. If you will, that I should labor. If you will. In his vineyard day by day. In his vineyard day by day. Then tis well if only then Jesus. Well if only Jesus. That says all I do or say. That is all I do or say. That death school finger. If he wills that death school finger, touch my feeble mortal clay. Touch my feeble mortal clay. Then tis well if only Jesus. Then tis well if only Jesus is my dying trust and stay. Is my dying trust and stay. Sweet At this time, I'm going to ask any of the youth or children up front if they have a hymn or sound they'd like to sing. Any hymn or song you'd like to sing, any of the youth or the children? Because they have all joined us up front. Yes, please, Cadence. Okay, would you like to come and sing it with us? <laughs> would you like to come and sing it with us, Cadence? Okay. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. That's number eight in both the new and the old. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. That's eight in both the new and the old hymnal. afternoon spirit session i'm going to ask for two volunteers to come and pray for us 
I'm going to ask one child or youth and one adult, two volunteers. One child or youth and one adult to pray this evening on behalf of our camp. And we are praying that, of course, we all see the need and the urgency to get ready for our crisis second coming. And therefore, we are praying for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Spirit at this camp. One youth and one adult. One youth for child and one adult. I'm not going to call any names. I'm going to ask for volunteers. After five seconds, I may call names, though. One youth for child and one adult. Coming, Ariana? Okay, Ariana's coming. I called one name. I'm not going to call an adult name. Okay, an adult to pray. No adults coming? Another youth then? Hosanna, you're going to come? Okay. How about you, Hosea? Uh, Sister Flo, you're coming? Okay, thank you. That was so tough. I'm doing some service again, though, guys, so next time we're going to try and it's going to be better. Can everyone please kneel for a prayer? Dear Jesus, please protect us through this camp. May we receive blessings. Give us wisdom and understanding. Please forgive us for anything wrong we have done through through this week so far, protect everyone, the sick among us, and the people that, that, that need help and that need to come to church to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, we are thankful to you for this opportunity of being at camp this year once again. We thank you for the fact that you see it fit to be able to have this opportunity that we can learn and consolidate so many important truths to prepare us for the end of time. Give us open minds and hearts to receive, to understand, to believe your truths, especially concern and connection with you, your love, your condescension, the fact that you would want to unite with people, sin sinners as we are, so that you can save us. So send your Holy Spirit to teach us all to use every presenter, to bless every adult, every youth, every child in attendance or online, so that Having gone through these days at camp, each one would learn of you and would be more fully converted. So bless us now and throughout the rest of the afternoon and even throughout the rest of camp. Keep out all evil by your holy angels and let only your loving presence abide in this place. So again, bless us all. Help the children to catch a glimpse and the youth to catch a glimpse of your love for them that now in the days while they are young they would allow you to be their redeemer so that you can use them as well so again hear our prayer 
Bless them, bless us all, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, sister, sisters Flo and Ariana. We are going to sing our theme song at this time. So it's on the screen for everyone, and we will stand at the appropriate time. Marriage feast is all prepared.
seated. We thank the youth for accompanying us this evening as well. Please be seated. Very good afternoon to all on this, our third day of camp, the afternoon segment. This is one of three sessions I am doing entitled Discussion. And I want to start by mentioning some important points. We are just about uh, a year and a couple months from the end of the middle or second watch of this generation, fifth generation or first, new first generation. Uh, our ministry started October 1984. So October 2024 will be 40 years. And uh, the importance of the 1888 message and the character of God message uh, were things we stood on, but we realized that light is advancing. And it is hard to say you know something or that you claim to profess to hold a message, but then the important question is, do you really know it? Do you really understand it? And are you really experiencing it? I'm going to start by a little, a little quotation. I wanted it to be put up, but the technical man says it's difficult. This is from Testimonies, Volume 5. You have a Testimonies, Volume 5, and your smartphones and so on. Uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. Uh, listen to this exhortation and warning. 5T. Let's read this to set the tone. And as you find it, or if, if you can't find it, uh, just listen to the reading. You can always look it up. I'm just going to say this right now. Uh, I think most of us should be aware of the tremendous attacks in the world on the third angel's message. Tremendous attacks. Every aspect of the third angel's message is being viciously opposed and attacked on all the social media, especially the YouTube and so on. And we expect that. But in Adventism itself, there is the attack on the 1888 message, the attack on the nature, the, the kind of human nature Christ took on, and therefore, final generation perfection. Uh, that, is, that, of course, is also opposed by those outside. But listen to this now. There is a new false doctrine that has arisen in Adventism, by Adventism, uh, not even known by outsiders, and that many Adventists are also being toppled by. It is called the Luni Solar Calendar, and the fact that the seventh-day Sabbath doesn't have to fall on the seventh day every week. And you'd be surprised how many are being toppled by that. So that's nothing from outside opposing. That's cancer starting inside. So I'm saying that when Jesus said that except those days should be shortened, even the elect will be under threat. And as I read this little quotation to start off, you will understand what I'm talking about. So I go now. Five Testimonies, Volume 5. Testimonies, Volume 5. I'm at uh, the... You want the chapter? Okay. This section is entitled, The Mysteries of the Bible, A Proof of Its Inspiration. That's the section. And uh, page 706, standard page in. The Mysteries of the Bible. Chapter 84, 
Okay. But that's how the, uh, the technology has it. In the actual book, it isn't, uh, it just has testimony 31 and testimony 32 and so on. Okay, good. Page 706, standard paging. This is how it goes. Peter exhorts his brethren to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know where that text is from? Whenever the people of God are growing in grace, they will be constantly obtaining a clearer understanding of his word. You got that? You got that? They will discern new light and beauty in its sacred truths. This has been true in the history of the church in all ages. And thus it will continue to the end. Everybody got that? New and clearer light all the time. But as real spiritual life declines, it has ever been the tendency to cease to advance in the knowledge of the truth. You heard that? As real spiritual life declines, it has ever been the tendency to cease to advance in the knowledge of the truth. Men rest satisfied with the light already received from God's word and discourage any further investigation of the scriptures. They become conservative and seek to avoid discussion. Whoa. Now comes this one. The fact that there is no controversy or agitation among God's people should not be regarded as conclusive evidence that they're holding fast in sound doctrine. You know, some people, when there is agitation and discussion and so on, people, some people say they're uncomfortable. They don't like... Uh, Agitation and discussion. The fact that there is no controversy should not be regarded as a conclusive evidence that people are holding to sound doctrine. There is reason to fear that they may not be clearly discriminating between truth and error. When no new questions are started by investigation of the scriptures, when no difference of opinion arises, which will set men to search in the Bible for themselves to make sure that they have the truth, there will be many now, as in ancient times, who will hold to tradition and worship they know not what. Well, well, well. I have been shown. Listen carefully. I have been shown that many who profess to have a knowledge of the present truth know not what they believe. Now here we've been having camp meetings for years, lectures for years, years upon years. People miss camp or they come, they don't come, or they have the book, they don't look at it, and so on. And all of a sudden you realize you realize something. You realize something. It is a pretty terrible diagnosis to me. I'm not talking about anybody the other night. I asked my, I was listening to a man on YouTube. The man was blistering the third angel's message. Trampling Ellen White, trampling everything. And I paused, I put it on pause and asked myself this question. Brother Douglas, before law court right now, and this was thrown at you. Let me hear your defense. Are you speaking to myself? I'm not mad. Uh, and I said to myself, let me hear your defense and no brimbling. And lo and behold, I started to brimble. I said, what? I said, but look at this thing. So I, I went then and reconcretized an area because when I heard this man, and then I heard another man from Africa saying, this man is, the man from Africa is solid, the man is saying, people Adventists in Africa are hearing these men from America 
on YouTube, lambasting Seven Adventism, and Adventists in Africa are beginning to wobble. He says, our people have been knocking about the truth for years and really do not know how to defend the truth when attacked individually. Whew. We claim we know the 1888 message. I heard another man saying, let me tell you all something. Even those who claim that they believe the 1888 message really don't know it either. Ask them a few questions. For example, you ask, you ask a person, was Jesus really tempted on all points like as we are? And the answer is quick yes. Next question. Using the definition of James, temptation is when one is drawn away of desire. Was Jesus drawn away of desire? Oh, no. So the man says, see what I tell you? You see what I tell you? When you carry things to the crunch, you see really where faith and understanding is. Sister White goes on. They do not understand the evidences of their faith. They have no just appreciation of the work for the present time. When the time of trial shall come, there are many, listen to this one, I took this very, very seriously and personally, there are many, there are men who now preaching to others who will find upon examining the positions they hold that there are many things for which they can give no satisfactory answer. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. That is why I was strongly impressed by the Spirit of God that after presenting, for example, this series, to let the book be looked at in groups and let people read and talk and say anything so that we will know where we stand. Because otherwise, we don't know where we stand. You see, it can come to church, hear a message, and say, Amen. You don't have a clue what the message says. Everybody saying amen, you say amen. You got to be like an old man in check all in the old time days called Fitz Graves. Even if a man from the General Conference came down those days and preached, Fitz Graves used to be like this. Bible and Spirit above. See when the man is finished, Fitz Graves will tell him straight. As he told one man, you want to say a thing today. And those things was nothing personal. It always too late for us to be saying amen and not know what we believe. Continuing. Watch now. Until thus tested, they knew not their great ignorance. What a term Sister White would use about people in the church all these years. What she, what, what she calls it? Great ignorance. And there are many in the church, listen carefully, saints, who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand singly and alone to explain their belief, they will be surprised at how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. These are serious statements, you know. Serious statements. I had a teacher who used to come in the class. Other teachers will tell you when the, when the test will come. I'm giving you all a test two weeks from now. So you go and prepare. This teacher will come in and do it this way. Okay, well, we, we, I think we're at chapter two. We'll, we'll continue doing some chemistry today. And all of a sudden stop and say, no, I have a surprise test today. There's a test right now. No chance to prepare anything. And men scrambling. You see, you see, when I tell you a test is coming, you go home and cram. And come in here and fool me. When I give you the test now, I see how you are digesting bit by bit as time goes. So if all of a sudden authorities came in here and haul all of us before law court and say, prove, for example, and what is a true prophet? 
prove this investigative judgment that you're all preaching from the Bible. I, I don't want to hear anything but the Bible. Prove to me how all these delineations in the chapter in the Holy of Holies with every thought and motive written down. And yet Jesus told the paralytic, your sins be forgiven you. And he didn't have to itemize every sin. And you start. All right. And you know, certain it is that there are, have, that, that there has been among us a departure from the living God and a turning to men, putting human in the place of divine wisdom. Coming to the end of this little quote, before we look at a question from the 1888 message that Jones made clear and is not understood by us or Adventists as we should. God will arouse his people if other means fail. Listen to this. Heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating chaff from the wheat. The Lord calls upon all who believe his word to wake out of sleep. Precious light has come, appropriate for this time. It is Bible truth, showing the perils that are right upon us. The light should lead us to a diligent study of the scriptures and a most critical examination of the positions which we hold. We should not hold it because it is traditional Adventism. We should not hold it because anybody says so. We should hold it because we have digested it for ourselves. What did Paul tell Timothy? What did Paul tell Timothy? Study to show yourself a workman, not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God would have all, listen to this one now. This is, we are on page 708. God would have all the bearings and positions of truth thoroughly and perseveringly searched with prayer and fasting. Wow. We're talking about the end is near, the wife must make herself ready. You see what is involved? We can't just drift along and then when, when trouble comes, we have to go before the law courts. Listen to what she says. God would have all the bearings. You know when you're driving the car, the bearings start knocking? Well, I know because the other day was told that my car sounded like an old truck. Bearings and all sorts of things. Okay. God would have all the bearings and positions of truth thoroughly and perseveringly search with prayer and fasting. Believers are not to rest in suppositions and ill-defined ideas, ill-defined ideas of what constitutes truth. Well, I feel it is this, and I feel it may be that, or it may be this. Ill-defined ideas of what constitutes truth. Or you don't see why it can't be this way. All that kind of talk can't hold up. Their faith must be firmly founded upon the word of God so that when the testing time shall come and they are brought before councils to answer for their faith, they may be able to give a reason for the hope that is in them with meekness and fear. Then comes these words, still page 708, agitate, agitate, agitate. The subjects which we present to the world must be to us a living reality. We, they must be to us a living reality before we talk about giving them in the loud cry. It is important that in defending the doctrines which we consider fundamental fundamental articles of faith, we should never allow ourselves to employ arguments that are not wholly sound. In other words, never try to prove a doctrine by tricking the opponent and using a false method of reasoning just to win the argument. She says it will come back in your face. Always use solid methods to prove what you're proving. Are you with me? These Trick arguments may avail to silence an, op an opposer. 
but they do not honor the truth. We should present sound arguments that will not only silence our opponents, but will bear the closest and most searching scrutiny. And that's what's going to happen by the opponents. With those who have educated themselves as debaters, there's a greater danger that they will not handle the word of God with fairness because they're just debating to win. In meeting an opponent, it should be our earnest effort to present subjects in such a manner as to awaken conviction in his mind instead of seeking merely to give confidence to the believer. Okay. And just lastly here, when God's people are at ease and satisfied with their present enlightenment, we may be sure that he will not favor them. Hear that? When God's people are at ease and satisfied with their present enlightenment, we may be sure that he will not favor them. It is his will that they should be ever moving forward to receive the increased and ever increasing light which is shining upon them. Pause there for now. We'll come back to this little quotation sometime in the past. Now, let me give you an example of this kind of a situation. Uh, some, follow me carefully. I'm going to go down a line now and I'm going to ask you questions as we go. I know, I know my, when my time is up. Now, angels in heaven, before sin developed, had sinless angel bodies, and they were innocent in their thinking. I'm going to use the word thinking rather than mind because there's another area that people get baffled with. I mean, they hear the shout, when they hear mind, they think brain. They had innocent thinking, innocent, innocent thoughts, and sinless angel bodies. Okay? How did sin enter the universe? By their choosing in their thinking to depart from God's way. So sin entered the universe by choice of intelligences to rebel. We come down, oh, follow me carefully, everybody follow me so far? Coming to an important point. Coming to Adam now, Adam had sinless human flesh and blood, innocent thinking, a perfect environment. So watch this, his body and his environment when we say body, we include brain in the flesh. Everything was in fact, was in fact, favoring him towards God. Are you following me? Favoring him towards God. In other words, the biochemistry of his flesh did not have any selfishness of chemistry in it. So any impulse coming up to his thinking would be towards God. What Satan? Satan came and implanted an idea, a thought. This thought, Adam held on to. Accepted it instead of rejecting it. And by that thought, Adam chose to disobey God. Up to this point, his body is still sinless flesh. How did sin enter humanity? By the choice of the first man, to rebel. People say, well, all of that is clear so far, dog. No problem there. Okay. Now, we know, too, that uh, the moment Adam sinned and uh, Moses, Moses moves fairly smoothly there in the area, uh, that is why I always say, thank God for the spirit of prophecy. We have clear light on the air from the spirit of prophecy. We know that the moment Adam sinned, the Son of God said, I will stand in the gap. That is not written down in Genesis. But it is written on the Bible. The Bible says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He stood in the gap and said, the, the consequences will fall on me. Let man have another trial. 
If that hadn't happened, there would have been instant annihilation of the race before any of us were born. Praise the Lord, the Son of God. Okay. So instead of annihilation, because of what the plan of redemption would do, it was just what we would call physical death. Now, having stated that, let me come to this point. So, all of us have received from Adam, because of the fall, a sinful fall on flesh. And, and of course, don't forget, the Spirit of Prophecy mentions a succession of falls. Because right after the fall, before the flood, listen to me carefully, things were still paradise in nature. Lions were not killing anything yet. Lions were still vegetarian. Mankind was still nearly 12 foot tall and strong, living nearly a thousand years. And we are told that successive falls have led to progressive evil. Okay. The difference between evil and guilt. If you see a lion killing a cow and eating it, that's, that's evil. Okay, because that wouldn't happen in God's perfect government. Is the lion guilty of sin? No, the lion has no conscience of right or wrong. Okay. Okay, so we, we have a sinful fall on flesh. Follow me carefully. And I'm going to read A.T. Jones a minute. A.T. Jones says, God will not be defeated by Satan. If sinless creatures with sinless body chemistry favoring them towards God, an innocent character, and Satan could throw an, an idea, and they grabble the idea, and rebel against God, God must, and this is what the final generation opponents don't follow, don't follow the deep issues involved with the great controversy, and I see now a group called the Former Adventists, they're re ridiculing the idea of a great controversy, say it's foolishness. You, you, we are going to be under such severe attack. We have to know what we believe. So, if God cannot now get his principle, his idea of self-sacrificing love back into mankind, though everything is against them, favoring him, and get them to obey, to follow him, as how Satan got his sinless creatures to depart, he cannot win the great controversy. He cannot. You understand this challenge? You understand the challenge? Perfect creatures, and Satan can't sparkle them. Messed up creatures, and God will restore them. If he can't, he can't win the great controversy. All right. So follow this carefully now. The second Adam, and we've, we've dealt with this many times from about 2014, this increasing clarity started to come among us. 2017, we had a whole camp book on it, and we did that book in Sapa School as well. But uh, I realized from, for me, for all of us, we have to keep going over, keep going over, keep going over. Now, Before I read it, Andrew Jones, let me say this. Uh, keep me abreast there with the time, please. Uh, what's the time now? Four o'clock? Okay. The second Adam, the second Adam, we know, gave us an acquittal from the condemnation that came by the first Adam. You know, and you have to know to prove that from the Bible. Romans 5, 18 and 19, and Paul says, of course, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ should all be made alive. Okay, you know those, those proofs, we, we, we'll deal with that another time. I'm just coming to an important point. So because we are, we have been legally acquitted of the Adamic condemnation, follow carefully, we as individual human beings are under probation. 
a second trial. And we must make up our minds one way or the other. We either make up our minds to accept what God has done to us, for us and given us in Christ, or we reject that. And then the judgment will declare how our minds have been made up, whether we go into a second condemnation because the first has been taken care of, or whether we are saved eternally. Okay. You cannot be both under probation and under there's, the law doesn't work like that. You cannot be both under a probation and under condemnation. And I always give this story. I give it again. I, I, I heard uh, our brother there give, use the correct term today. But I, 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 let me give this example again before we get to a point. When slavery was abolished in America, when the president stamped the emancipation papers, and by, by the way, that's the same term the Spirit of Prophecy used, that our emancipation papers have been stamped with the blood of Christ. When the president stamped the emancipation papers, every slave in America was legally free, whether he knew it or not. In those days, they had no cars, so men on horse and buggy and horses went blowing the bugles. The president has set all slaves free. Some slaves didn't believe it. So they remained on the plantation working as slaves, still under the dominion of slavery, but legally free. When they heard the good news and said, okay, we accept that good news and walk off, they now became experientially free following the, leg the legality. And, and because people are sinning, we are quick to say, well, they're under condemnation. They haven't heard the good news yet or made up their minds yet. Okay? We shouldn't confuse, therefore, uh, being under the dominion of sin because we haven't yet made up our minds for Christ with the fact that we have been legally acquitted from the Adamic condemnation by what Christ has done for all men. We've been uh, sounding this now for years, but... Uh, uh, it, it, okay, good. So listen carefully now. Therefore, it means that no baby is born under the Adamic condemnation. No baby is born under the Adamic condemnation. No baby is born, therefore, a sinner. Baby is born with sinful fallen flesh, like, just like a lamb or a cow. No baby is born a sinner. So let's come now to uh, the understanding of what sin is, we, everybody quotes the definition, sin is the transgression of the law. So, uh, by the way, in case you don't know, in case you don't know, uh, let me just summarize this little part. So, Adam lost his innocence by his choice to sin in a sinless body. In other words, they became guilty or they became sinners by choice, not by nature. Okay? Adam did not sin because he was a sinner. Adam choosing to sin made him a sinner. Is that clear? Okay. Now Jesus came, before we get back to the, the thing there with babies, Jesus came. Jesus came. And... Jesus' innocent character had to be tested like Adam's innocent character. Jesus had sinful flesh. Everything around him was against being favorable for God. And in his sinful fallen flesh, with everything against him, does any good thing come out of Nazareth? Everything against. He chose to remain loyal to the principle, the Father's idea of self-sacrificing love. And therefore demonstrated that what Satan did and was rejoicing that he could get sinless beings to fall, God now got sinful humanity to obey in Christ. Okay. We can come back to Christ in a minute and notice something. All right. So a baby, a baby. What does the spread of prophecy and the Bible tell us about? Babies. Let me give you a few quotes here. Ellen White uses the term innocent 
in describing babies because until the child reaches the point of knowing right from wrong, guilt is not reckoned. A lion eating a cow, that is evil, but a lion is not guilty because the Bible tells us, let's find this text, James 5.17, James 5.17, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sin requires knowledge and understanding and choice. Before a baby can reach that point, it is not a sinner. It has to become a sinner by choice. Now, uh, l l listen to a few of these points carefully. Great Controversy 67, 67, paragraph 2, tells us that Herod will face the judgment for killing all of those innocent babies in the days of Christ. What do babies call? What are the babies that he killed call? Innocent babies. In that's GC 67, paragraph 2. In Councils on Diets, 220, paragraph 3, I can get all these written down for you. And the White says that mothers who eat badly in pregnancy cause their innocent offspring to inherit trouble. What do your offspring are called? Innocent. In Fundamentals to Christian Education, we are told, and, and it is our ages as well, children love to play around Jesus and to stroke that loving face with their innocent hands. Repeatedly, the term innocent is applied to children. But let's look at Jesus now. Isaiah 7, 15 to 17. Listen, listen, listen to Jesus. Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 15 to 17. An important point. You know why this study is important? The people against final generation perfection really believe that sinning comes by nature. And therefore, Jesus could not have taken our sinful fallen flesh, otherwise he would be a sinner. And we, with sinful fallen flesh, cannot be perfected. You see how they're reasoning? And if we are not absolutely clear in every detail, we may think that we don't agree with them, when we, in fact we are also wobbling. Listen to what it is said about Jesus now in Isaiah 7, 15 to 17. Isaiah 7, 15 to 17. This is Jesus now. Jesus. Isaiah 7, 15 to 17. And then we come to uh, some important points. Isaiah 7, 15, right through we can 15 and 16. Isaiah 7, 15. We can start from 14 to get the context. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Who is this? Is the prophecy about who? Jesus the Messiah. Verse 15. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Verse 16. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both for a king. So at the point must be reached in a child, even for Jesus, that its consciousness knows right from wrong before any reckoning of sin is talked about. So babies are not sinners, okay? They have sinful fallen flesh, but they have to reach the point and Ellen White says it varies from child to child. Some children as early as eight, she says, can be baptized. Others may not be able to until 14 in terms of really knowing what they're doing. So, sinful fallen flesh does not make us sinners. We have to choose. You know Let's get it even more clearly. Signs of the time... Signs of the time, December 18, 1893. Write this down. The last paragraph. Signs of the time, December 18, 1893. Third the third last, third last paragraph. Third last paragraph. Signs of the times, December 18, 1893. ST, December 18, 1893. Paragraph third from the last. 
Listen to this. Before sin exists in the heart, the consent of the will must be given. Can a two-year-old baby give consent of the will in, in matters that we are talking about? No, hence the term innocent. Before sin exists in the heart, the consent of the will must be given. So a big grown-up man saying that he rape a girl because he can't control himself, that's his nature. It don't even stand up in the law court furthermore before God. He chose. Okay? He's not a tree. A sinful nature cannot make you do anything. That only happens in trees that don't have minds, okay? You have to choose. But well, sometimes, sometimes you're running or walking. And you got to be careful with this. As I heard of some uh, incidents, incidents really, which was very sad recently. Sometimes you're walking or running. And this is biological now. Nature calls. You can't, because nature calls, you can't stop in, in the middle of the road. So you fix your choice. To suppress that call until he gets somewhere. And that's, and that's biological, which is not even dealing with sin. But only to show that people who say they do so and so because that's me and I do so and so because that's my nature, they're coming down the wrong line. We do not, it is not our nature that makes us sinners, it is our choice. Okay. All right. Uh, by the way, if I'm going to 80 Jones now. 1888 message. Somebody asked this question to Jones in 1895. And then I will have to stop there because our time will be up. By the way, uh, what did Jesus tell the Pharisees? The queen of the south, meaning who? Queen of Sheba. Will rise up with this generation and condemn it. Because she saw Solomon in all his glory, and a greater than Solomon is here with greater light that you reject in. So sin and condemnation has to do with quantity of light given and rejected. The people of Chorazin will rise up in, this, in the generation. Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus said, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because the light that Sodom and Gomorrah had can't compare with the light you have. Light and knowledge and the choice of the will. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is a sin. So Martin Luther, great reformer, did not have the Sabbath truth. Okay? That's why on the way up, all the saints will keep a Sabbath. All right. Now, listen to A.T. Jones. I, I think we just have time to quote that and close. And we'll come back to this. The other thing we have to come to is this loony loony solar thing that is troubling a lot of people and I have found out because when I first listened to it I said oh could somebody think of this and it looks so wobbling and then I realized that the answer I heard a chap talking about it who was not even an Adventist I realized the, the answer is straightforward and what says one thing about truth is that it is straightforward and clear and progressive she says error has to be dodging about and wobbling and be complicated. But before we get to that, we also have to look at uh, a few things in the investigative judgment that are on the sea fear attack and Adventists can't answer. But let's look at A.T. Jones here now. On page, this is chapter, and then I'll lay out, ask the questions. Because you might be saying this is supposed to be discussion, but Doug, now you're just talking. So I can stop in a minute. Uh, Third angel's message, number 14, 1895. Message 14, 1895. Listen to A.T. Jones here. And then I'll stop and let you ask any questions until the time goes. That whole chapter go over again here since. A.T. Jones, lecture 14, 1895. Go over it. You've got to keep going over it. The question is, does Adam's, does the second Adam's righteousness Embrace as many as does the first Adam sin. You hear the question Jones is asking? Does the second Adam's righteousness 
embrace as many as does the first Adam sin? And he answers, look closely. Without our consent at all, without our having anything to do with it, we were all included in the first Adam. We were there. All the human race were in the first Adam. What that first Adam, what that first man did meant us, it involved us. That which the first Adam did brought us into sin, and the end of that sin is death. And that touches every one of us and involves every one of us. Jesus, the second Adam, took our sinful nature. He touched us in all points. He became we and died the death. And so in him and by that, every man that has ever lived upon the earth and was involved in the first Adam is involved in this and will live again. There will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and on the unjust. Every soul shall live by, again by the second Adam from the death which came by the first Adam. Okay, so he's showing that Christ cleared that condemnation. Listen to this now. Listen to this question that somebody asked. Well, says one, we are involved in other sins be besides that one. Now comes the statement from Jones. Not without our choice. When in the Garden of Eden, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, he set every man free to choose what master he would serve. And since that day, every man that has sinned in this world has done it because he chose to. 1888 definition. We sin by choice. And if our gospel be here, then of course, read this chapter again. Jones goes down to Abraham. He said, Abraham living in Babylon. Everything against God. Sinful fallen flesh. And God came and told Abraham, come. And he said, Abraham chose to believe God and follow God. And he said, if Abraham did that, nobody has any excuse that the environment, the flesh, or anything. He was raised a heathen, grew up in a family of heathens, worshiping idols and heavenly hosts. He turned from it all unto God and opened his eyes and used them. And Satan never had a chance to blind his eyes. And Abraham, a heathen, thus turning from among heathens unto God and finding God in Jesus Christ in the fullness of hope, that is one reason why God has set Abraham before the world as an example that of what every heathen on this earth may find. He is a God set forth example of how every heathen is without excuse if he does not find God in Jesus Christ by the everlasting gospel. So the 1888 message tells us that because of the plan of redemption and what Christ has done, human beings, the moment Christ said, I will stand in the gap, God set man free to choose. And we cannot use our nature as any excuse for sin because the judgment will determine whether we have chosen Christ and receive his uh, thought pattern or whether we've rejected him. And we can't come in the judgment and say, well, I didn't choose Christ because I had a sinful fallen flesh when Jesus, the son, God the Father would say, my son came in that sinful fallen flesh and when his consciousness was mature, he always chose me, showing us that we have no excuse. The world, the flesh, is no excuse for us. And therefore, those who hold on to nature will eventually come to the conclusion that Christ really couldn't have taken our sinful fallen flesh because that makes you a sinner. And we, with sinful fallen flesh, can't be perfected because only when Jesus comes to change that flesh can we stop sinning. And we know that that is the opposition to the fact that the final generation will be perfected by the gospel. Time is up. And more, more we can discuss. But let me open up for your questions and what you have to say so I can see if you understand, oppose, or what. Any points, any questions? Time is up? Okay, well, time gone. Sorry. What's the time? It's 4.20? Okay, I can press on until 4.30 when the next session is, if you don't mind. Any questions? Yes. Psalm 51.5. Read it for us. Microphone. Says, Behold, an iniquity was brought forth, and in sin conceived me my mother. Yeah. How would you, how would you look at that text? Well, he was born in sinful fallen flesh. 
That text doesn't say that he, as a baby, was born a sinner. He was conceived in iniquity and in sinful fallen flesh. Okay? People read into that text what the text doesn't say. Yes, Sister Margaret? Yes, good evening. Good evening. So based on what you're saying, that a child is not born in sin, um... It's not born a sinner, sorry, thanks. It's not born a sinner. Then, would you say then that we need to relook our position when we refuse to bless in the church children that are born from parents that are um, not in good, out of bad, thanks, out of bad law? Would we need now to, because what it seems to mean that we are the child is innocent, the parents are guilty, but we are making the child pay for the actions of the parent. Would we need to relook that position? Uh, first of all, Sister Margaret, we are not punishing the baby. We are dealing with the adult. So the argument that we are punishing the baby when the baby is innocent is not the correct premise. We are dealing with the adult who committed a sin and we are simply, well, let me put it this way. Uh, we simply, let me use this term. We simply send a signal to adults. The baby's innocent. We simply send a signal to adults that that behavior or that act, though will be forgiven by God and we forgive, we set a particular signal that it is not something to be done and we will nearly come and say, the baby innocent, so blessed. It has nothing to do with the baby, it has to do with the adult. Okay, for example, uh, uh, I'm sure if a man, correct me if I'm wrong, if a man uh, robs a bank with a million dollars, and come and say that he's really interested in the work, he can give half a million to the church, the money innocent, the money is innocent, but we will tell you, man, what? We are not taking stolen money because you're a thief. So it has nothing to do with, we're saying it has nothing to do with the baby. We are not punishing the baby. We know the baby is innocent. This standard, I, I know there are differences of agreement on it, and it can be discussed, but I'm simply saying it is not done to punish the innocent baby. You know, warming up. Who's next? I, I don't have a point. I was just going to say that yeah. maybe we could use the time for the study to go and finish this discussion since so many people have questions. It's just a suggestion. No, I have another session tomorrow. We know, oh. We're not going to study, trouble our book study. Brother Williams, you're yes, next. Sir. Go ahead. My mind, my mind goes back to Brother Patrick's session with. Rehab and hiding the spice. Mm -hmm. And I get the impression from when you had made mention of Jesus and his walk with the two disciples to Eminus, mm -hmm. and he was as if though acting as if though he didn't know what was going on. And just to get into them, you were seeing, asking the question. Was Jesus sinning? And you were um, automatically saying, no, he was just feeling into them and such like. Yeah. Come around to the baby. Or, or can we get the impression that with Jesus as a baby, he could have thrown a tantrum, but because he was not at an age where he didn't able to differentiate between right and wrong that God could have been seeing it in the light of huh? could, could it be that God could be seeing it in the light of Rahab or Jesus never ever do none that come close to look like sin? A baby suffering colic. Listen to me carefully. 
a baby, a baby suffering colic and therefore crying and screaming, which we call a, a tantrum, is not sin. It is a consequence of sinful fallen flesh. What do you mean, therefore, by tantrum, you will have to tell me? Tantrum, to my mind, is that a baby needs something, wants something, and the people the nying the baby, the thing, and the baby rustle on the ground and kick up and stuff. Uh, I, I, I consider that a tantrum. That's not sin. Baby is hungry and its physiology is crying for satisfaction. The baby has not reached the stage to know right from wrong. It is screaming in response to sinful fallen biology. Okay. How many more minutes left? I'll be back tomorrow. Two minutes. Well, okay. Well, you can't really do anything in two minutes. All right. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow we'll come back here and finish off this and then we have to look at the, uh, some issues in the investigative judgment that are being attacked and Adventists don't answer in and the lunar solar thing that have there's, a, there's an error that started in Adventism and have Adventists wobbling and people are saying that uh, we can't answer it either. These things we have to look at. Pardon? The lunar solar error. Which bar? We started with Adventists developing it. Are you know which part? North America, North American Adventist. Okay. Huh? Why no? I, 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 North America. You were saying something, brother. Good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, no, I agree with everything you said. Um, to me, I think we have to be now a little clearer on our definition of the carnal mind. I agree with you that from the time we say you're a sinner by nature, then we throw out the whole theology of perfection. But the understanding of the carnal mind, I think needs clearing up, is the person who is carnally minded in bondage to the flesh? That's the question. Well, the first question is, what is the carnal mind? Is the carnal mind in bondage to the flesh? And how does it fit into the whole idea of sinning by choice? Just those three questions. All right, tomorrow, because it brings us back to mind and the Pauline definition a thought pattern a thinking pattern okay thank you uh tomorrow we'll continue this session thank you very much let us pray heavenly father we thank you for our discussion we thank you for the warning coming from testimonies volume five that discussions and asking questions are all good because we have to reach the point among ourselves and each for himself herself that we examine our positions and understand them from the word of God. Be with us now as we get ready for our book group study and continue in this camp to consolidate us in truth as we discuss and share and have differences of opinion, bring us to the truth as it is in Jesus. We pray with thanks given in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as we get ready now for our uh, book group study. Thank you. We we'll continue this tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning. It is it.